say welcome and thank you for joining the World Affairs Council of Connecticut to discuss Syria, Iraq, and the U.S. For today's structure will be a conversation with Emma Sky and Ambassador Robert Ford, moderated by our CEO, Megan Torrey. Uh, and now let's get started. I'll turn it over to Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council. Hey everyone and welcome. Thanks again to, for joining us to our community around Connecticut and also around the country. We are so happy that you are joining us. Um, tonight we have two very special guests that are great friends to the World Affairs Councils um, all around the U.S. We have Ambassador Robert Ford who was uh, U.S. Ambassador to Syria um, from 2011 to 2014. He's a very seasoned career diplomat. Currently, he's a scholar at the Middle East Institute and a fellow at Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. And also from London, we have joining us Emma Skye, who is the director of the Yale World Fellows Program and senior fellow at the Jackson Institute at Yale. She's the author of The Unraveling, High Hopes and Missed Opportunities in Iraq and In a Time of Monsters, Traveling in the Middle East During Revolt, which was recently published. Emma served as advisor to the commanding general of US forces in Iraq, and also as advisor to the commanding general of a, a NATO's international security assistance force in Afghanistan. Thank you both for joining us tonight. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And so before we get started, I just wanna ask how both of you are staying safe um, uh, and, and you know how you're doing. Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you, here in London. And Ambassador Ford. And, and I'm up at um, Moosehead Lake in north central Maine, where uh, winter is still not finished. <laughs> that they, I'm so glad that both of you are staying so safe and well during this time and that you could join us. Um, so because so many of us have been um, extremely focused on the coronavirus and uh, COVID-19 around the globe, I thought we could start by sort of reacquainting ourselves with the current issues um, that, we're, that the U.S. In, it, is facing in Syria and Iraq. Um, and so let's back up and take, take a note of where we are today. So Ambassador Ford, do you want to talk a little bit about Syria? Sure. Um, just a couple of key things for people to know about Syria. Um, the civil war, which started in earnest in 2011, is not finished, uh, but it is winding down. Um, there was a lot of fighting in January in the northwest part of the country, and the northwest part of the country uh, is still held by uh, opposition groups, and there are approximately 2.8 million civilians there too in a space that frankly is probably no bigger than the size of Connecticut. Um, and there are huge worries about the safety of that civilian population. They've suffered bombing from the Syrian Air Force, from the Russian Air Force over the years, hospitals being bombed, etc. cetera. Uh, now they also have to worry about coronavirus um, because their uh, living conditions are rather dire, certainly not sanitary, and there are very few health facilities, in part because the Russians and the Syrians bombed them. So that's, that area is still troubled. There's a, at least another ceasefire right now. Um, there have been a ceasefires before and they have failed. Um, in, that's in northwest Syria, not so far from the Mediterranean Sea. On the other side of the country in eastern Syria, closer to Iraq, there are still about maybe six, 700 American soldiers. Um, the American Air Force is still patrolling the skies on the east side of the Euphrates River. Um, they have been there now since 2015. That goes back to the Obama administration. They were originally sent there to fight ISIS. Uh, these are the Americans that work with the Syrian Kurds. They're still fighting ISIS, although ISIS has lost control of all of its territory, and it's sort of fighting a, a low-level guerrilla war. They can't really take and hold territory, not the way they could, say, four years ago or five years ago, um, but they're still around. They still do a little a car bomb attack here or an assassination there, and so the Americans are chasing them. The Americans are also holding some oil fields in far eastern Syria, not far from the Iraq border, which they're really trying to keep out of the hands of the Bashar al-Assad government and the Russians. Uh, because 
the American policy on the broader question of Syria is that the Bashar al-Assad government needs to make deep political reforms and the Americans have sanctions and are holding these oil fields uh, in order to put pressure on the Assad government to implement those reforms. Uh, and so that's really where we are. Emma, do you want to walk us through where, um, you know, what's the status on the ground in Iraq now? Well, last night, you know, I was here in London. I got this message over Facebook from someone I don't know, never heard of before. And he said, here we are in Iraq under lockdown. And, you know, he says, I have a book club and we're reading your book at the moment as part of our book club. And we have some questions for you. So I said, okay, how can I help? We said, the first question is, did America deliberately seek to bring about civil war in Iraq? And this is a question that you hear so often. Iraqis find it very difficult to understand America, America's policies, and so they always look for conspiracy theories. And they say, look, there was a civil war, did America, you know, it must mean that America wanted to bring about civil war. So that was the first question, trying to clear up, no, there wasn't a conspiracy. Civil war happened because policies collapsed the state and the elite bargain that the US put in place institutionalized sectarianism. The second question they had was, why does America continue to work with Iraq's corrupt politicians? And you know, that was a, a difficult question to answer because it's the system in Iraq is one, it's, it's a rentier state. So the economy is based on oil and government lives off oil wealth. It doesn't live off the hard earned taxes paid from, you know, the, the, the hardworking citizens do. So this means there's a very unaccountable relationship between the political elites and the people. And then, you know, in most countries, when you have a democratic system, you have parties that are in government and parties, you have opposition parties. Where in Iraq, all the parties are in government. So every election, there's no choice because everybody is in government. So we had a conversation about how the structure of the economy creates this system. Now, I spoke today to a couple of friends of mine who are officials in Iraq. And I said, how are things going with Corona? And they go, coronavirus, you know, we've got 52 people dead so far. That's the least of our problems. You know, our whole economy depends on oil and the price of oil has really dropped. We can't afford to pay salaries. We've got massive debt. Now the incumbent prime minister, well, I can't say he's incumbent, the prime minister, Adel Abdel Mehdi, resigned a few months ago due to the protest in Iraq that started in October, demanding a complete overhaul of the political system and reform. So he resigned, but they've been unable to agree who should be the new prime minister. And somebody called Muhammad Alawi was nominated by the president to have a go, and he spent a month and he couldn't form the government. So now the president has put forward a guy called Adnan Zofi, and he's now only got two weeks left to form a government. And it's not sure if he'll be able to do it because Iran and Shia political parties don't support him. Now, another issue that the officials are very concerned with is the future of the US forces in Iraq. There have been attacks on US forces by Shia militias, and you saw things escalating um, in, on New Year's Eve with the attack on the US embassy in Baghdad, followed by the US assassinating the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani and the head of Kitab Hezbollah. And so this was supposed to deter future attacks, but there have been continuing attacks by Shia, Shia militias on US forces who are based inside Iraq. And those US forces are now being consolidated in two bases. They're pulled back from the other ones and paid.
H missiles have arrived to protect them from Iranian ballistic missiles, but this doesn't protect them from um, the sorts of Katusha rockets that are fired by the Shia militias. So that's kind of the state of things at the moment in Iraq. Thank you so much. Um, and just a reminder to all of those listening out in the audience, you can submit questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, please um, just ask your questions and we will add them to the queue. Let's take a look at um, Syria and Iraq in relation to US foreign policy and its strategic importance okay. now. Um, we know that uh, policy in this region was so monumental that um, it caused the Secretary of Defense Mattis to resign. Um, so let's talk about now during this crisis, where, what is the strategic importance of um, Syria and Iraq? I think this is a really important question. Uh, Iraq in 2020 is not, uh, it's not as important to the Americans as it was in 1990 or 1991 with George Herbert Walker Bush. I don't think it's as important as it was in 2005 with George W. Bush, or even in 2010 with Barack Obama. Um, American strategic interests in the Middle East, I think we need to think about uh, in, a, in a fresh way. And the coronavirus and the problems that we have had with our own health system here suggest to me that we need a reconsideration in many ways about the amount of resources and time and attention of senior officials um, on foreign wars versus things here at home, speaking very frankly. Um, so Iraq is important, but not at the top of the list of our overseas issues. Not as important as China, obviously. Not as important as Europe and Russia, obviously. Not as important, frankly, as Mexico and Canada, with whom we have all kinds of important relationships. Iraq has now fallen onto, I wouldn't even say a, a second tier of uh, national interest, but probably even a third tier. Its oil is not vital uh, to stability in international energy markets. Uh, prices now are way down because of Russia and Saudi Arabia, not because of Iraq. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's not to say that we have no interest in the country and we expended enormous resources there. Um, we still have a small, not gigantic security interest there with respect to uh, extremists. But I don't think that should drive uh, a, a gigantic amount of American, senior American attention to Iraq right now. So I'll ask both of you to answer this next question. Um, let's talk about the Kurds. What do we do about the Kurds? I'm going to let Emma start. <laughs> I was going to hand that back to you, Ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. The policy in Iraq has always been to have a one Iraq policy and to look at the oil as being the glue that holds the country together, that the Kurds would gain more um, money by being part of Iraq and getting a budget transfer of 17% than it would if it went its own way. The Kurds of Iraq are landlocked. They have neighbors that don't want to see them independent. And that has been the policy up till now. Whether that will be relooked in the future, in the near future, I don't know. As the ambassador said, Iraq is far less important to the US now. And when you look at the current administration, it doesn't really have an Iraq policy. It has an Iran policy. And Iraq is part of the Iran policy rather than as something separate. So um, I have a couple of things to say on the Kurds. Um, First of all, um, they have been, uh, in many, many instances, terrific friends of the United States, uh, both during the time Americans were fighting hard during the war in Iraq 15 years ago. Um, the Kurds and their 
uh, Peshmerga fighters were, were good friends of American soldiers. And their political leadership uh, in Iraq um, also were good friends of the United States. Um, they have problems and there are um, occasional protests against those Iraqi Kurdish political leaders, our friends. Um, so they have, they have some political baggage and I think people should remember that here. Um, on the Syrian side of the border, different Kurds, not the same. Um, and they too have been uh, really good partners to American military forces in the fight against the Islamic State. Um, very good fighters um, and very brave, very organized. But, and I think here is where I differ sharply with a lot of the American foreign policy establishment. The fact that the Syrian Kurds worked so well with us against ISIS was not a favor from the Syrian Kurds to the United States. It was not a gift. Uh, they did it because they had their own interest in doing it. Their interest was they wanted to eject uh, the extremists of ISIS, the terrorists of ISIS, out of their communities. And that's perfectly understandable. I would certainly want the same if I were in their shoes. But that cooperation was a limited one-time situation against ISIS. Um, the Syrian Kurds also have a political agenda and their political agenda is uh, autonomy now and independence somewhere down the road. They won't say that publicly, of course, um, because they know how destabilizing that would be in the Middle East. But we didn't sign up for their political agenda. And they're operating now under an American Air Force no-fly zone in Eastern Syria, as I mentioned. That umbrella, that military umbrella from us, from American taxpayers, is enabling them to carry out their political agenda, which we never signed up to. And the political agenda is deeply unpopular with Turkey. It's unacceptable to Russia and Damascus. The Iranians don't like it. And even the Iraqi government is very dubious about it. So we're sort of out there protecting uh, those Syrian Kurds without any regional friends in the process. And we're actually um, causing quite a bit of friction between Turkey, which is one of the G20 economies, it's not a small thing, uh, and the United States. Friction, which I think at this point is needless. And so I disagree with a lot of the American foreign policy establishment that we owe a debt of some kind to the Syrian Kurds. Um, cooperation on a joint project does not uh, entitle one of the two partners to a long-term indefinite commitment uh, from the other partner. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, taking a few questions from the audience now. Um, so this one is for you, Emma. So what do you think the likelihood um, of, uh, is of Iraq sort of becoming um, a battleground for escalating, attention, escalating tensions between the US and Iran? I think Iraq is a battleground. It's certainly how Iraqis feel. They want to have good relations with both Iran and the US. Iran is their neighbor. Iran is the country they share a very, very long border with. And there is trade between the two countries. There's religious tourism. They know they have to have a good relationship with Iran, but they also want a good relationship with America. And, you know, they're in a very hard position. America has got these big sanctions that it puts on Iran. And yet Iraq needs Iran for electricity supply, for trade, for all of these things. And Iraq is unable or unwilling to prevent Shia militias from attacking US forces who are based on Iraqi bases. And this is very frustrating to the US and it wants the Iraqi government to do more, and in the absence of the Iraqi government doing more, taken action, and they have targeted the sheer militias, 
and there's been some collateral damage which has caused upset inside Iraq. So yes, we do see tensions escalating from time to time, then they go down again, and then there's another peak, and it keeps going up and down like this. The Shia militias that are supported by Iran want to drive US forces out of the country. And for them, that's what success looks like, a withdrawal of all US forces. So how, um, how much and to what extent did sort of the killing of Qasem Soleimani in, in Baghdad, you know, just a few short months ago, um, impact relations? A difficult one to answer, because at one level, Qasem Soleimani was a key partner of the Iraqi government. He had been instrumental in helping the Iraqi government defeat ISIS. And the militia leader, the Iraqi militia leader who was assassinated alongside him was the head of all Shia militias in Iraq, the popular mobilization forces. And so both of them together were seen as key in the fight against ISIS. Now some will say this attack reinstated American deterrence. Others will say that Qasem Soleimani was instrumental in brokering relations between Iraqi political elites. And one reason why they haven't been able to form a government, they will say, is because Qasem Soleimani is not there to help broker. Others will also argue that these Shia militias that keep attacking American forces are not necessarily getting direct orders from Iran. And some will say it was you know, the two guys who were killed, they were the ones who could keep these different groups on some sort of leash. So there are different arguments on this. I think it's still too early to tell. Iran did launch the ballistic missile attacks, which led to a uh, hundred or so US soldiers suffering from concussion, traumatic brain injury. But there might be longer term attempts by Iran to exact revenge on America. And they are patient. Those might come in the future. Uh, thank you so much. Ambassador Ford, can you talk a little bit about um, U.S. relationships with allies and adversaries in the region is impacting relations? So how, you know, working with NATO or not working with, with NATO, um, what role Turkey is playing um, in the region? Yeah. Um, well, Turkey is a big player in Syria, and um, it is definitely one of the actors in Iraq as well. Its role in Syria is relatively more important, so let me start with that. Um, key things to know. Um, Erdogan is a real problem. Um, he has a, a set of domestic policies, human rights, uh, economic policies. Um, he's erratic and he's the president and he's very hard to deal with. Um, but that said, um, it's his forces, not Americans, uh, not United Nations. It's his forces that ended up protecting those 2.8 million civilians I was talking about in northwestern Syria. Had it not been for, frankly, a, a a really bold Turkish action to confront the Russians eyeball to eyeball. I want to emphasize that to the audience. The Turkish military went eyeball to eyeball with the Russians in Syria and the Russians blinked. Uh, and so there is this ceasefire that I mentioned in Northwestern Syria. Will it last forever? I doubt it. Um, but it is at least given those civilians a space. Um, a space of time, if nothing else. So at the same time, the American relations with Turkey and Syria are really scratchy because of uh, that Syrian Kurdish faction that we work with against ISIS. That Syrian Kurdish faction, there are many different Syrian Kurdish factions. We picked one that has a strong militia um, because strong militias are useful allies against terrorist groups like ISIS. Um, that Syrian Kurdish faction is 
uh, directly linked to a Turkish Kurdish group that is on Turkey's terrorism list. It's also on the United States government's terrorist list. It's also on the European Union's terrorist list. Um, and so the Turks have looked at us now uh, for the last four years and said, why are you working with one terrorist group, Syrian Kurdish faction, against another terrorist group, ISIS? Um, and the answer is expediency. Um, Turks didn't find that very convincing, and they're concerned about that political agenda I mentioned of an autonomous zone, eventual independent state, and so they've intervened. Donald Trump got out of the way. You saw the hullabaloo that broke out in Washington from both Democrats and Republicans, none of whom, as best I can tell, think about anything beyond sort of vague uh, comments of U.S. credibility. Um, I remember distinctly Robert McNamara's book about Vietnam. In retrospect, I use it at Yale, where he said, beware of where you're in a situation and you're fighting because of your credibility. That's usually not a good reason to be in a war. So um, our relationship with Turkey, um, especially in Syria, is really problematic. On the Iraq side, very briefly, um, the Turks have a pretty good relationship with Iraqi Kurds. We could go into that if people are interested. Um, so it's not as scratchy as it is over in Syria. Um, and the Turks maintain a military presence there and they conduct still military operations against that Turkish Kurdish faction, the terrorist group that has bases in far northeastern Iraq. They do it with the permission of Iraqi Kurds who don't like those uh, terrorist Kurds either, their political competitors. And so um, sometimes the Turkish actions draw the ire of Baghdad when they go after these groups up in uh, northeastern Iraq, but for the most part, Baghdad accepts it. And so this has kind of been going on now for years. Emma, do you have anything um, to add about uh, you know, allies and, and adversaries in the region? When we fought against um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the strategy was very much that it's only the Sunni community that can really defeat Al-Qaeda. And so it needs, we need to empower the Sunni community to fight against Al-Qaeda. And so in Iraq, you saw the Sunni awakening. And in Syria, you could argue the same, that it has to be the Sunni Arabs of Syria who truly defeat ISIS. But that wasn't the approach that was followed. And for reasons that Ambassador Ford laid out, it was decided to work with the Kurdish forces because they were the most effective fighting force. The approach in Iraq enabled Sunni Arabs to have an honorable way out of insurgency and bring them back into the political process. Inside Syria, this hasn't taken place at all. And the situation is pretty grim in terms of how does the country reconcile and move forward. So a question from the audience about um, the Kurds. They want to know if uh, foreign governments should be supportive of a, a separate Kurdish nation. Who wants to take that one? Well, I will start. Um, there are absolutely a lot of people here in this country, including um, in the Congress and in other parts of Washington, that support uh, an independent Kurdish state. I think the most important thing for Americans to realize is, A, um, this is not an American issue. This is an issue for peoples in the region, including the Kurds, but also their neighbors. Remember, the border lines of what that independent Kurdish state would be are not at all clear. In many cases, the communities are mixed very closely together, Arab village over here, Kurdish town over there, a Syrian Christian village over here, a Yazidi village over there. Where is the border going to be? Nobody agrees on that. Um, how are you going to divide things like um, oil? How are you going to divide things uh, like national bank accounts. I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And if it isn't done by negotiation, if it's done by fiat, if, for example, 
the Kurds just declare independence, I think it is reasonable to expect that other governments in the region, Turkey, Syria, maybe even Iraq, uh, they might fight. And that's not an American fight. And so my, my advice to the Kurds throughout, when I was working in both Iraq and in Syria, is that if you want independence, that's not unreasonable, but you need to be willing to negotiate it. Um, and when they would say to me, well, you didn't negotiate it in 1776, I would say to them, well, yes, but we fought. And we fought the British, we had French help and we won. But don't assume that the Americans are gonna come and help you fight for independence. It's not an American battle. It's not an American issue. Emma, anything to add? The Kurds have always had difficulty in defining their borders and their leadership. So when you talk about the Kurds, there isn't a unified one political leadership for the Kurds. Yeah. The last or well, the most recent country to gain independence is South Sudan. And South Sudan did have a lot of support from, you know, American pop stars and actors that mobilized international support for them. When the Kurds, Iraqi Kurds, went forward with their referendum a couple of years back, there was only one country that came out recognizing their independence, and that was Israel. And when you look at the Middle East, the Kurds are gonna need more support than the state of Israel if they're going to be able to get agreement in the United Nations for them to have independence. So let's move on a little bit to talk about the U.S. presence in the region. Um, we know that, you know, only a few months back, we were hearing about the possibility of U.S. troops being asked to leave Iraq. Um, how do we see the U.S. role as we do see these decline in, troop, in the troop presence in the region? Emma, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the Iraqi possibility? You know, the U.S. withdrew all forces out of Iraq in 2011 because the Obama administration didn't gain a status of forces agreement with Iraq. And three years later, ISIS had taken over a third of Iraq. Now, the reason that ISIS took over a third of Iraq was because of the breakdown in Iraqi politics and the sectarian policies pursued by the prime minister of the time, that was Nur al-Maliki but it's lodged in people's minds that American troops leave and ISIS came up. So American forces returned in 2014 to fight ISIS, about 5,000 forces, enabling forces on the ground, Iraqi forces, Kurdish Peshmerga forces to fight. And that was done through an exchange of letters between the two governments rather than an official status of forces agreement approved by the parliament. America has always said it would, would withdraw its forces if the Iraqi government asked them to. It's always said, you know, American forces are there at the bequest of the Iraqi government. Well, after the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the Iraqi prime minister, the caretaker prime minister, asked for US forces to leave. And there was a vote in parliament, which wasn't really attended by the Kurdish and Sunni members, just by the Shia members, who said that Iraqi, said that US forces must leave Iraq. And the Trump administration said, no, we're not gonna discuss that now. But having said that, you know, President Trump has said he wants to get all forces home, wants to end the wars. And this recent peace agreement in Afghanistan has set in place a process to withdraw all US forces from Afghanistan. So I think it remains to be seen how that proceeds. And I think that will influence in some degree the policy in Iraq. But while there is still this heightened tensions between the US and Iran, then the US wants to keep forces inside Iraq. 
Ambassador Ford, what's your, um, what do you think about uh, U.S. Pre presence, especially in Syria? Well, let me just add something real quick on Iraq, and then I'm happy to talk about Syria. I think it's really important for the viewers to understand that the presence of American forces in Iraq, having them on the ground in Iraq, is not an American national security interest by itself. It's a tactic. It's only a tactic. It's a tactic to secure a broader national interest, which the Trump administration, like the Obama administration before it, defined as combating ISIS, combating ISIS, so that they don't come after us someday. ISIS now in 2020 is not at all what ISIS was in 2014 or 2015 or 2016. In Syria and in Iraq, it's lost almost all of the territories it controls. In Iraq, like Syria, it's operating a kind of a guerrilla war, assassinations, occasional car bomb attacks. It's not them that are shooting missiles at the Americans in Iraq and killing an American uh, civilian and then killing two American service members a month ago. Um, those are Shia militias. The, the deployment of American forces in Iraq was never intended to fight Shia militias. That was not the reason they went, and that is not an American national security interest. So as we think about the future of those troops, if we don't have agreement with the Iraqi government that they're going to control those militias, I think then we have to recalculate the entire utility of this tactic. And are there other ways to contain ISIS so that it doesn't come after it again, come after us again? Maybe this time the Iraqis will be better than they were in 2014 and they will be organized in such a way that they can contain ISIS. Maybe uh, ISIS has damaged its standing among Iraqi Sunni Arab communities so severely that they will not support it the way that those communities did support it in 2014 and 2015. But we should be thinking about if we have to leave, what are the conditions that we want on the ground so that we can leave and leave safely. Um, turning to Syria, as I said, we never sent American forces into Eastern Syria to help the Syrian uh, Kurdish faction build an autonomous zone with the name of eventual independence. Um, that was not the purpose they went. Now they're holding oil wells, um, basically to keep them out of the hands of Bashar al-Assad's horrible, awful, dictatorial government. Um, and the idea is basically that the Americans are going to just try to economically strangle uh, Bashar al-Assad's icky, awful dictatorship, strangle it economically, heavy-duty sanctions, uh, hold the oil well, try to isolate them from the rest of the world economically. Um, and the Americans are having some effect on that. It's the sanctions are tough, and they are tougher under Trump than they were under the Obama administration. But it's not clear to me that Bashar al-Assad gives a hoot about the economic welfare of his people. And if they go into the streets to protest about bread prices, um, my guess is he'll tell his security forces, shoot them. That's what he's always done in the past. So this American idea that we can strangle Assad enough to extract concessions out of him, that's not so clear to me. And I myself am uncomfortable in general with the idea of putting American forces on the ground at any place with vague political hopes, not analysis, um, of what can be achieved by their presence. I'm, I'm much more like Colin Powell. I'd like a clearly defined mission with benchmarks and short-term and medium-term objectives. We can tell if we're making progress. And if we can't do that up front, we can't do that up front, then we shouldn't deploy the troops. Holding oil wells in eastern Syria indefinitely doesn't really sound like a well thought out strategy to me. Thank you. So one of our other speakers, um, Trita Parsi, argues that um, with U.S. Uh, military dominant, dominance in the region, the U.S. has prevented regional actors from working together to um, resolve their conflicts. Um, what's your take on that? Emma, do you want to start? 
so in other words, without US presence, um, the Middle East would be a more uh, peaceful place. Well, that assumes that all the problems in the Middle East are to do with America. And, you know, President Obama, basically in that interview that he gave in the Atlantic was saying that the Saudis and the Iranians must learn to share the region. And, you know, this hope that there would be a natural balance of power would be found, like was found in Europe. And I just don't think that that happens in the Middle East. We haven't seen that natural balance of power. What we have seen is different countries supporting fighting each other through proxy forces. So I think, you know, at one level, yes, people in the region need to sort out their own problems. But if what happened stayed in the region, then you could just say, let them be. But as we saw from the Iraq war, and particularly the Syrian war, what happened there didn't stay there. You had the outflow of refugees, which have had huge impact on the European Union and on policies inside Europe. And of course, you had terrorist attacks. So it's not easy to just turn your back on the Middle East because things, all the problems don't stay in the region. Ambassador Ford? I, I think it is useful for the Americans to encourage, uh, especially Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and the Gulf states, uh, to have some kind of channel to talk. And I noticed that after the Iranian attack on the Saudi Aramco facility last September, uh, where uh, really it was a very good strike. I mean, they hit exactly what they were aiming at and um, caused a lot of damage to Saudi Aramco. I think it sobered the Saudis that the Iranians had that capacity. Uh, it's very interesting to me that after that attack, both Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, who are so vociferously against the Iranian government, uh, both of them uh, set, up a, set up diplomatic channels with Tehran to talk. And I think that's useful. Um, it's not to say that we should immediately pull all of our forces out of the Middle East and, um, and just leave it to the countries there to settle their disputes because Syria is a great example. Um, probably there'd be a lot of fighting before there'd be negotiations leading to any kind of deals. So to the extent that the Americans are able to deter Iran but not write blank checks to the governments in places like Abu Dhabi and Riyadh, um, I think uh, the American presence might be useful, but we should not be discouraging the Gulf states from talking to the Iranians. I think that channel needs to be explored and broadened. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about what's to come in the future. Um, uh, the, an audience question, how do you see the future of U.S.-Iraq relations? Um, you know, what is going to happen, um, you know, in the future? Emma, do you want to start? You know, I really hope that the relationship between America and Iraq moves beyond a military one. When you look at those young people who've been out protesting against their government, they have this dream to live in a safe environment, to have opportunities, to use their talents, to use their skills. It's to the West that they look for inspiration. They're not queuing up to get visas to go to Iran. So they're, you know, they're very connected with American culture. They're very global in their outlook. They're international. In, in their dreams. And I hope America will provide more opportunities for young Iraqis to come and study. That will provide more exchanges that will help build up the institutions, the education, the health sector, all of these things. So I hope it will become a re more normal relationship and that the military component will be a smaller and smaller one of the relationship. 
Ambassador Ford, when we look at Syria, do you see an end to the conflict? Um, are you afraid that, uh, you know, the actions of the Assad regime will be normalized? Certainly, Russia is trying to normalize uh, Assad's image around the world. The Russians are making a real effort to do that. Um, the, the Assad government's war crimes, I think, speak for themselves. And um, any of your viewers that want to know more about those war crimes, Google them. There are lots of reports from the United Nations or Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and others um, detailing those. Um, so I think it's going to be hard to normalize Assad. I think he's always going to be a pariah from here on out. Um, a different question is what should the American approach to the Assad government be? And here, I, I admit that I'm torn. Um, I met Assad twice. Um, never had a foreign leader lie to my face the way he did. In all the countries I worked in, no foreign president ever lied so directly to me. And he knew that I knew he was lying and he did it anyway. Um, so I don't have a great deal of respect for him, um, not to mention his um, war crimes, but he has won the civil war in the sense he's not going anywhere. He's gonna be in control of most of Syrian territory for as far out as the eye can see. And so we will have to figure out some kind of modus vivendi with him. Should we remove sanctions? No, uh, not unless we get something good in return. Um, should we send a new American embassy? No, uh, what are they giving us? Um, I think we have to be exceptionally transactional. Um, he's holding American citizens. You saw the Trump administration highlight the case of poor Austin Tice, an American journalist who's been held there for six years, it's atrocious, it's atrocious. Uh, it's the way Assad treats his own people too. So I'm not suggesting at all that Americans normalize with Assad. I think any business we do with him has to be very transactional, um, but we are gonna have to figure out a channel with which to deal with them, if for no other reason than because ISIS is operating in um, eastern Syria where we are, the guerrillas I mentioned, they're also operating where Assad is. And um, we don't want the ISIS people where Assad is uh, to get so strong as to cause new problems as well. So as our time is just about coming to an end, I wanna ask both of you, if you're looking at the region in five to 10 years, what's your best case scenario? Emma, do you wanna start? The best case scenario. <sighs> well, hopefully Bibi Netanyahu will have retired by then and will no longer still be prime minister inside Israel. I think it would be nice to see a whole new generation of leaders emerge, ones that want to build a regional, um, a regional block, like a European Union type thing. They would try and build that in the Middle East, that they would look for regional security architecture. It wouldn't be an anti-Iranian front, it would actually be everyone coming together. So it would be a change or a different approach by the Iranian regime that Iraq would have diversified its economy away from oil, that Bashar al-Assad would no longer be in power, that you'd see more and more women in public life. And you'd have this new Middle East that we once thought might come about through peace be between Israel and the Palestinians. That dream of the 1990s seems so distant now. But there are hopes. There are still people in the region who do believe, who have got dreams that they could have economic opportunities, they could live in security, and that they could be friends with the rest of the world. And I think when you listen to the young people in the region, that's the dream that they have. And we shouldn't lose sight of that, even in these times, which are very dark times for them. I think Emma's absolutely right. These are dark times. Uh, the price of oil plunging as it is, is not going to make things easier in the short term. 
I don't want your viewers to get too pessimistic, however, and here's why. Two short reasons. Number one, on the political side, the country of Tunisia, small country, population of about 12 million in uh, the middle of North Africa, uh, is actually a success story. Uh, it's not perfect, has a lot of problems, uh, but it has gone from a mean, nasty dictatorship uh, to a fairly functional democratic system. And a democratic system where Islamists are in the system and they work within the system and they don't threaten the system. They actually compromise, they make deals, and sometimes they even resign or retire from senior government jobs and turn them over to secular Tunisian political figures because the Islamists themselves understand the system is good and it works to their advantage as well as to the advantage of their political competitors. That ability to compromise is so lacking in most Arab political systems, whether it be next door in Algeria or in Egypt or in Libya, which is terribly fractured right now. Um, and I won't even mention the Middle East states. Um, but Tunisia at least gives me hope. Second thing that in the long term, not that Tunisia's model can be copied tomorrow, it's not a cut and paste job, um, but it tells me that people can, can work a way forward. Second thing that gives me great hope, there is a, a young um, up and coming generation in that part of the world. It's a young population to begin with, and there are a lot of young people there who are very plugged into planet Earth through the internet, through satellite TV. Uh, they're on WhatsApp, they're on Instagram. Um, and and if, the, if these governments, these repressive governments could at least get out of the way of those young people when they try to build small businesses, when they try to bring innovation, um, when they try to set up networks and so that small business and medium-sized business can move ahead and compete, um, if the governments would just get out of the way of those young people, um, I think you could see a real surge in world-class competitive companies. Um, but it's hard when you have so much red tape and corruption. Maybe the price of oil falling although it will cause hard, hardship in the short term, government budgets and how to pay salaries. Maybe it's good in the long term because governments will have to open up investment from private sector people or they will be inundated with unemployed. And so maybe there's a silver lining to that oil price cloud. I want to thank you both for sharing all of your expertise and insight with us tonight and for offering, even in dark times, hope in, in future generations and in hope for the future. Uh, I very much look forward to the time where we can welcome you in person um, again. And I want, I wish all of you, um, you know, uh, health and, and happiness in the future. And I hope you both stay safe and well. And in the same thing to our audience, um, stay safe and safe and well, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you for inviting us. Of course. No, our, our pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>